Hello everyone and welcome to my Total War Warhammer 2 Rise of the Tomb Kings review. This DLC content released on the 23rd of January and it was developed by Creative Assembly and published by Sega. This is the Total War franchise's most expensive faction pack or race pack to date and in this review I'm going to go through all of the content on offer so you can decide if it's worth the asking price. So the Rise of the Tomb Kings DLC is considered a race pack for Warhammer 2. This means that it introduces a new playable race, the Tomb Kings, in the already established campaign, the Vortex. The Tomb Kings are also playable in the Mortal Empires campaign if you own Total War Warhammer 1 and 2. We'll touch on this a little bit later, but I won't be dwelling on it too much. If you want to see my review of Mortal Empires, check the description. Pretty much everything I mentioned in that covers how I feel about it still. So I just wanted to outline what comes with the pack before we do a deeper dive on the content itself. The Tomb Kings features four playable legendary lords, each with their own starting factions. They all share the same roster, except for Arkin the Black, who has a few additional Vampire Counts units. This roster is made up of 23 new units and three distinct hero units, as well as a new lore of magic. It also adds variations of these units with special attributes as Regiments of Renown, which are available in multiplayer, and Legions of Legend, which are campaign only. There's also seven quest battles and a bunch of new battle environments in the desert as well as all new siege maps that feature Tomb King architecture. And for the first time since Shogun 2, new music has been added to the game to fit the Tomb King's culture. Now I'm not taking anything away from the pack, but it is worth mentioning that the environments, cities and music are all in the game now for free, as well as the Tomb Kings themselves. You can't play as them, but you can fight against them and fight in their cities. Like I said, not taking anything away from the pack, but I just want to inform consumers about what you're purchasing. These types of free updates, they always create quite a tricky proposition as a reviewer. Most of these assets wouldn't exist without the DLC, but you don't need to buy the DLC to get them, so it's just worth informing you on that. The Tomb Kings do not care about the Vortex. They don't fight for control of it, they don't have rituals. The Vortex, as far as they're concerned, is just a spot of bad weather up in the north. What they do care about are the books of Nagash. There's 8 books in total and you need to have 5 of them to win. There's actually a ninth book with Arkan but nobody else can obtain it. You can see any of the books locations at any time and typically 4 of them are in settlements and 4 of them are held by rogue armies that wander around the map. Either taking a town or beating a rogue army with a book in it will give you that book permanently. You can't lose it, it doesn't move around after that and that's just basically it. Getting 5 of the books will trigger a final battle, and we'll get to spoilers on that a little bit later. So in terms of a campaign objective, the books are pretty mundane. Typically in Total War games, your victory conditions will say, take 5 towns, defeat this faction, and hold 50 settlements or whatever. And here we basically have victory conditions that say, take 4 towns, and kill 4 armies. You only need 5 though, so you can pick and choose which ones you do. The most interesting aspects to this are that each book does grant you different global buffs, which are pretty cool, and the rogue armies do move around, which is also really cool. I think it would have been really nice if the books were fully dynamic and could have been both gained and lost, and if the other Tomb Kings also went for them. It could have been competitive like the Vortex and dynamic, maybe giving you more chance to explore and fight different races. Instead, it's just a little bit static and for me at least it wasn't all that interesting to do. You might think, oh come on darn, it's just victory conditions, they're fine. And they are. But because of these conditions, I only fought my immediate neighbours, which were minor factions or other Tomb Kings. I never fought any other legendary lords, visited any other continents, and I won the game only by owning 30 regions. I mean, that's a pretty inclusive experience for such an open-ended sandbox, and I wasn't trying to make that happen. Now you can still go for the domination victory if that's what you want to do, which is your traditional kill the major factions and own 50 settlements deal, but you don't progress the story or get the cutscenes or fight the final battle in that way. All of the race mechanics are the same for each of the Tomb Kings factions, so I thought it would be best to outline these mechanics and how they play out, before talking about how each lord differentiates the gameplay. The first real big thing you'll notice when playing as the Tomb Kings is that they don't use money to recruit or to sustain units. Instead, they have a strict army cap that increases with time through research and conquest. This is quite a unique concept in Total War. The only time I think I've ever seen this is with tremendously old mods that would require populations to recruit instead of money, or one mod in particular allowed free recruitment because you were seen to be a rebellion. Even those mods still had some form of upkeep cost per unit or per city. You typically need something to slow the player down. 
So departing away from any costs attached to upkeep for units or for buildings is a really big departure and for the most part I find it works really well and if nothing else it gives you a very unique way to play Total War. So if you can just recruit for free what's to stop you from building 100 armies of all the best units? Well to put it simply army caps and unit caps will stop you. There's a hard limit on the amount of armies you can field and there's a hard limit on the types of units you can field. When starting a campaign you can actually only field one army. If you try to make a second army, you, you just can't. It won't let you do it. So to get more armies, you have to unlock a dynasty. Now dynasties are the Tomb King's tech tree with a very important structure baked into it. A dynasty will typically take around 15 to 20 turns to unlock. This will give you access to a new army and open the tech tree further to allow you to get a special lord and a series of global buffs. In that regard, each dynasty sort of has a theme. Now the catch is that each dynasty researched will slow down your research rate by a hard 30%. Not 30% of your current rate, but a hard 30%. So this means research exponentially increases and eventually your research will come to a stop. To combat this, you need to take settlements and each settlement occupied increases that research by 3%, each city by 5% and each 10 slot city by 10%. So this means that for roughly every two provinces owned, you get another army at the regular rate. Now of course, even if your research rate is half of what it should be, you'll still get your next army, it'll just take a bit longer. If you take towns really quickly, it'll get faster. Now as I said before, you never lose this progress. Army capacity will never be taken away from you, it only gains. This makes the Tomb Kings an extremely difficult race to deal with the further along the campaign is. They could be pushed back all the way to just one province, and still be able to field eight armies. When it comes to the different types of units, they still can't just recruit 20 of the best units per army. They need recruitment buildings to lift individual caps on units. So for instance, the military building Open Graves gives you access to four skeleton archers globally. If you want to have six, you need to make another Open Graves building. Then you can recruit up to eight, and you can recruit them for free. There are two base units that don't have a cap, so if you've lost pretty much everything, you can still field armies made up of these two base units. Now they're not very good, but numbers do still count for something. So in summary, Tomb King's strength comes from time and owning settlements. I find that this really suits the theme of an undead faction. They can wait forever if needs be, they will only grow stronger. They can lose a full army, and a few turns later it'll just be back. They're kind of like a plague. The more they spread, the faster they can spread, and the more resilient they become. But what is arguably its biggest strength is probably its biggest issue. The Tomb Kings are a giant snowball. They start very very weak and very slow in relation to other factions. As they spread they become more and more powerful and even if you're not that good of a player, you'll start gaining armies over time and you can overwhelm your enemies with great ease. Because they don't take part in the vortex, no main race really seems to care about them and they don't have to deal with the numerous Skaven and Chaos armies that try and hinder you. I feel like the classic Total War problem of, once I get to a certain size, the game becomes easy, is extremely heightened here, and I can see the tipping point in my campaign, where once I defeated my main enemy, I blew up in strength and numbers like I've never seen before. Now don't get me wrong, this happens to almost every faction, it is a Total War problem, and hurdling chaos armies at you isn't a smart or fun way to deal with it, so I'm glad that the Tomb Kings didn't go that route. But it does seem to have just accepted and almost embraced the fact that mechanically, the bigger they get, the stronger they get, and it never really stops. I mean, when your tech tree is full, it will sort of stop, but after I owned about 25 settlements, I was unstoppable, and I did stop at 30 towns because I won the objective. So arguably for some, the gameplay can be a bit arduous at first, and then really easy later on. Your mid-game is the most interesting, but it doesn't really last that long. Given some time, you'll just keep getting stronger, whether you're doing something right or not, and I think that is a problem with how the race functions. That said, this money-free military is still a really cool mechanic. The research to settlement to army trade-offs are really fun to work with, as are the unit caps. They make you organize and distribute buildings in a way that greatly enhances the strategy on the campaign. Previously, there was never a reason to have two or more of the same military building in a province, but now they stack and give you a benefit. It also just really feels like an undead faction. I mean, typically I'd be annoyed that you don't care about your troops and you just throw them away, but with an undead faction, it fits brilliantly. A big part of the Tomb King economy is a new resource called Canopic Jars. Canopic Jars can be earned by taking settlements, building higher tier buildings, specializing generals, and completing missions. Now, the Canopic Jars are used as a currency in the Mortuary Cult. The Mortuary Cult is a new screen that allows you to craft items by combining Canopic Jars, gold, and certain resources. 
For instance, on the higher end of the scale, you can instantly get increased army capacity. So again, relating to the fact that that snowball never really stops. Some other cool additions are the Legions of Legend. As mentioned, these are higher tier variations of existing units that once you pay for, can instantly recruit them for free. And if they die, you could just re-recruit them after a cooldown. You don't have to like recraft them. You can also craft over 40 unique pieces of equipment to place on your lords and heroes. The highest tier stuff will have magical spells bound to them and pretty high stats, so it can be pretty useful. This is an excellent feature. It completely replaces the loot economy of the Tomb Kings. They don't earn post-battle loot. They have to make their own or get lucky and steal it from other lords. The reason this is good is because typically you'll earn a huge numbers of items at all different times, all with different effects and playstyles, and it can be a bit overbearing to manage equipment or to even care about what you get. With the Tomb Kings, you can look through the list, see something you like and say, I'm gonna work toward getting that. You can check the map for the resources and attack accordingly. It's cool. It gives the player the flexibility to decide and customize how they want, clears out all the crap you get and motivates you to think about resources more. You might see the resource you want is held by someone else and you can then decide whether or not you want to trade with them or take the resource yourself. There's really nothing wrong with the Mortuary Cult. I do only wish I could sell or trade items back for more jars because you still accumulate a small amount of stuff that you don't want through battles against lords. I think that could extend the life of the economy within it. I suspect this is a feature we'll want to see again in future games, and there's lots of ways to make it even deeper or even historical by combining technologies to create new armor sets or weapons or whatever. It's a very cool system. The last few bits and pieces to touch on are the rights. Now the rights can all be activated with gold, you don't really need anything else for them. The first right grants you a special artillery unit. The second right grants you a hero that can colonize settlements and instantly get them to tier 3. He consumes himself when he does this. Now the third right is a defense mechanism causing mass sandstorms all around your territory and attrition to anyone who walks through. And the last right is an economic one, generating growth, canopic jars and reducing construction costs. Nothing too crazy with these, the growth one is just one I used all the time, whereas the others were very circumstantial but really effective at what they do. The sandstorm one just visually looked amazing. Now there are four lords with the Tomb King's pack, Setra the Imperishable, Grand Hierophant Katep, High Queen Kalida and Arkin the Black. The lords factions have extremely minor differences between them, but three of them start really far apart, surrounded by different enemies to give you a bit more replayability out of them. When comparing them as heroes and not just factions, they become a bit more diverse. I don't want to go too deep into this stuff as it gets quite granular, but the lords will play differently on the battlefield. They have different skill trees and different battle buffs. Arkin gets the lore of death, Kalida's armies do poison, Setra's war sphinx is insane, and Katep can mount an artillery unit and has the lore of Nehakara, so the lords will definitely feel different in battle. On the campaign, not so much, I mean they all abide by the same mechanics, they just have different scenery and different quest battles. The lords also have slight variations on the cutscenes in the game, but largely follow the same plot with their own perspectives. It's worth mentioning that the cutscenes are absolutely excellent in both terms of art and cinematic effort and how they're presented. The audio and visual effects combine to create an immensely detailed living comic that really sets the stage for the journey you embark on. I do only wish there was more of them, I mean they're the kind of thing I wish we had for agent actions or for every quest battle. The Tomb King's army composition is made up of extremely weak and brittle troops combined with extremely strong constructs. Constructs are a new type of unit that act as a sort of magical statue come to life. They cannot rout and are immune to terror, so they kind of become this necessary backbone of any Tomb King's army. These units look amazing and more importantly, feel amazing to use. The Great Bow Ushapti, when used in large numbers, can open gates and smash towers with relative ease. The Sword variant have great animations for splitting their weapons and reforming, just like a statue come to life. They're really great to watch and when they die, they solidify and tip over, which is a really nice touch. The rare constructs are absolute behemoths on the battlefield. The Tomb Scorpion is one of my favourites. When it stops moving it hunkers down and becomes like a statue as with most of the constructs, but when enemies are near it raises its tail and waits until you give the order. It can often be seen burrowing through the ground and shredding units apart, it's a really creative and fun unit to play with. Despite the allure of the higher titan, I actually found that the Necrosphinx was the real draw of the battlefield. 
This unit is primarily meant as an anti-large combatant and uses massive size to destroy its enemies. It's also really fast for such a big unit and it just gallops towards enemies, often by itself to begin getting to work. It's pretty terrifying. When it comes to battle mechanics, the Tomb Kings have a tiered battle system, whereby after a certain amount of losses they will start regenerating for a brief time. And they do this three times before being able to spawn a unit of Ushabti anywhere on the battlefield. I personally really like the addition of the tiered health boosts. I'll often just send in constructs at first to do some work, pull them out, and then send in the father for them to initiate the boosts for the constructs. The Tomb Kings also have the crumbling mechanic, so while a lot of their units are unbreakable, they will start to deteriorate when their leadership falls. We've seen this with the Vampire Counts in Warhammer 1, so it's nothing too new. However, because of the weakness of the Tomb Kings early on, your armies can get wiped out several times. To help you recover, your lords are immortal, meaning even if they die in battle, you can re-recruit them with their skills intact later on. However, your heroes are not, so I found it pretty hard to get a priest or prince to a high level in the first half of the game, because your units are so limited and your armies are so weak. There are three new types of hero, the Lich Priest, the Tomb Prince, and the Necrotect. The Lich Priest can use the new lore of Nekara. This lore is very focused on damage spells such as damage debuffs and damage buffs. There's no healing, spawning units, or projectile spells. It's a pretty cool lore, but I never actually really used it that much in my campaign. The Necrotact hero is a really unique addition. They're designed to support constructs entirely through heal abilities and armor abilities, so I like the idea of having a really defined role for them and thought they played very well together. As for siege battles, the new Tomb King cities are exactly like the non-Tomb King cities in terms of layout and how you play them. This is pretty disappointing, but was to be expected. I mean, I had hoped for some new tactics, such as scorpions burrowing under the walls or Hyro Titans being a melee artillery piece, you know, smashing the walls down. But the siege battles remain the same, and the biggest units are still limited by the size of the gates. Even with the new army roster, sieges will feel instantly familiar and repetitive. Like I said at the beginning of this review, I won't be dwelling on the Mortal Empires campaign for too long as it does require purchase of a separate game, but owners of both Total War Warhammer 1, Total War Warhammer 2 and the Tomb Kings DLC can now play as the Tomb Kings in Mortal Empires. Everything in this campaign operates the same, all of the mechanics remain intact, however retrieving the books of Nagash is entirely optional. The story and cutscenes are removed, as is the final battle, and the start positions for the lords are moved around to accommodate the new combined map. Chapter objectives replace the story in keeping with more traditional Total War titles and I'd say that I actually prefer these objectives as they incentivize you to visit more unique locations and fight unique races more frequently. Now something I failed to mention, which is actually a victory condition in Mortal Empires, is the unique pyramid buildings dotted around the map. These buildings are unique to the Tomb Kings and grant global buffs on completion. I love the addition of these buildings as I slowly discovered them myself in the Vortex campaign. In Mortal Empires, it's required for victory, but it doesn't actually tell you what settlements you need in order to build them. Turns out they're all close together in the Southlands anyway, so it's not really a big problem, but you wouldn't know that until you take those territories. Now rather disappointingly, it's worth mentioning that the Tomb Kings have arrived with a bunch of random bugs. For me, performance of Warhammer 2 has now dropped significantly. The textures on several desert maps seem really stretched, and the shadows seem to be outright broken. The most severe bugs have been hard crashes throughout my campaign and battles, of which there was around 8 or 9, and a few instances of the end turn and many buttons locking out and forcing me to kill the process and reload. My favourite unit, the Tomb Scorpion, is also prone to getting wedged in walls, which almost lost the battle for me in the early game as my most powerful unit was rendered immovable very early on. I'm surprised to say the least that after this DLC was seemingly pushed back, it still arrived with so many technical issues. Let's get this guy then. I think my game just crashed. I can't believe my game just crashed after that battle. Are you fucking kidding me? It froze again. <laughs> I don't want to do it a third time. So spoilers ahead for the final battle. If you don't want to see it, please skip to the time on screen now and you'll be fine. We're just going to touch on this for a brief moment. The final battle for the Tomb King sees you fighting with or against all other Tomb King's lords over the Black Pyramid. This map looks absolutely gorgeous, and it's even reflected on the campaign with the city opening up and rising through the air. 
It must be the first time in a Total War game since Empire that something on a campaign settlement was then seen in battle and vice versa, and while it was a pre-scripted thing, it was still amazing to behold. The battle itself for me was actually really close and tense. The game seems to understand that you'll have your best troops here and really challenges you with the different armies that come your way. Playing as Arkan, he's sort of the villain here, I had the pyramid to my back and had to fight all the other Tomb King's lords almost simultaneously while I was reinforced with Vampire Khan's monstrous units. It was really very cool and I did beat it on my first go so it wasn't overly hard but it was still very close so it worked out very well for my playstyle. If you play as a different Tomb King faction, Arkan is the sort of big boss you have to take down and you'll fight what is essentially a 3v3 right in front of the pyramid. It's a real spectacle. This battle worked way better than the Vortex battle by putting all armies in the fight at once and having you much closer to the actual interesting scenery. It was a fantastic end to the campaign, and once you actually win, it also grants you a very powerful endgame buff. All of your units will receive the regeneration trait while in battle, and your armies will be able to move further and you'll get more armies to field. This essentially turns the snowball into like a comet and lets you just mop up the campaign should you wish. For me, one of my criticisms of the regular campaign was that your endgame buffs were so small, so I'm glad to see you can just go crazy and give you very powerful buffs here. I mean, if you've won the game, I think it's a fair reward to give the players something really powerful and reduce that slog to painting the map. The Rise of the Tomb Kings for Total War Warhammer 2 is one of the more unique races added to the Total War Warhammer trilogy so far. Whether you're a franchise veteran or this is your first Total War game, its campaign will make you rethink how you approach the very fundamentals of the series. The Tomb Kings addresses some long-standing issues with the base game, allowing you to deal with loot in a more fun and engaging way through the Mortuary Cult, ignoring the repetitive aspects of the chaos and skaven hordes flung your way by the Vortex, and dealing you a final battle worth fighting. Unfortunately, these ambitious innovations have heightened other issues with the series, such as stretching the early game struggle and amplifying the late game slug. Ignoring the vortex mechanic also means you cannot play in a co-op or head-to-head -head situation with other races, so if you want to play with a friend, you either both require Tomb Kings or you both need Mortal Empires. While the army roster and race mechanics are unique and have their own playstyles, the individual sub-factions feel like they've had less care and thought put into them. The lords are unique and somewhat innovative, but there isn't much reason to try out another lord other than having a change of scenery. The Tomb Kings is a very good piece of DLC. It adds a significant amount of content to Total War Warhammer 2, either through its accompanying free DLC or extra Mortal Empires gameplay. Though it does have many little niggles that hold it back, be it campaign balance issues, victory objectives that leave you wanting more, a lack of real battle innovation to freshen up sieges, or outright bugs. Now that's it for my review of Rise of the Tomb Kings for Total War Warhammer 2. Let me know what you think of the race pack and if you'll be picking it up, or if you've got your hands on it already. I always put a poll on the end of my reviews to see if you agree with the score, so make sure you let me know through that or in the comments below. These reviews are pretty much entirely funded on Patreon, it's not just some side gig, but directly contributes to this channel, so if you'd like to see more strategy game reviews, DLC reviews, or just videos in general, consider supporting over there. Remember, if you liked the video, drop a like, and I'll see you in the next one.